all hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Everybody on the Zoom call hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can't see you though. Right, we're not seeing you yet either. <laughs> there we go. Some light in front of them instead of the window in the back. Why don't you turn off the light here so you can see better? No, that's, that's the problem. Andrew? I can see his back window and light perfectly. Your, your light makes you appear really dark, Andrew. <laughs> so nope. your window is back. Yeah, I can't do anything about the window, but I can turn off the light here. Does that help or is it worse? I would, I would just make a suggestion. I know that yesterday people were having problems understanding and hearing and I don't, you know, I mean, I don't know if wearing the mask might, I'm not suggesting you take the mask off, but maybe when you're talking, especially you, yeah. that maybe you might have to, if they're having a problem hearing. Yeah. All right. If you do have a problem hearing us, let us know. We'll try to talk more clear. All right, let's call this to order, this meeting to order. Have we been properly noticed? Yes, we have. Uh, public comment, correspondence, or communication? I have none. Um, I, I, can, I certainly can. Uh, I received a notification from uh, some of my constituents. Uh, I didn't bring the documentation with me, unfortunately. Uh, about flooding uh, that they claim has increased over the past few years as a result of Mequon Golf Course. Uh, I shared that with Don and with Rhonda and with Andrew, and we really haven't fully discussed that yet, but uh, it's, there's a number of issues that might be involved uh, from, I don't know if anything's changed at the golf course, to uh, this project that we've approved about the, uh, the wetland uh, improvement of uh, Meekland parking area. Uh, so, so, Andrew, I apologize, we just haven't touched, I mean, we haven't been able to connect, but uh, it's something we're looking into, and there may be an issue there, there may not be an issue there, but it's a, uh, a, a comment that is I did go up there yesterday and look at it and nothing's changed except there's some flags so, out, you know, where we're going to do the work, I believe. There is, Andrew, is that our property back there where there's a whole bunch of uh, dirt brought in? Yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, good. Good Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, uh, that, that is our fill project. That is the fill coming from our Little Menominee uh, River project. Um, and that was all, all permitted and so forth. That particular fill project, in this case, I don't think really has anything to do with, um, with what we're seeing in the drainage. And, and just to um, uh, Bruce's comments as well, if you'd like uh, under manager report, I, I did get a chance to, to look at some, uh, some information and I can present that under my manager report if, you, if you'd like to talk further about it. I, I have some information, we just looked at you know, topo and soils and things like that, the drainage in that area. And um, and I could provide further information if, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, any other public comments? Hearing none, uh, move on to uh, approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion, motion approved. Uh, motion. Carried. Carried. Right. Uh, appointments to the Energy Action Committee. This 
committee needs to designate someone to serve on the Energy Action Committee. Any volunteers? <laughs> Hearing none, I do I default to that? <laughs> All right. Well, more policy, a member of this committee needs to serve on the Energy Action Committee. So, Ethan, um, can, you, can you tell us what the time commitment is for that? What the meetings are like? They're generally in the afternoon. They meet three or four times a year. Okay. I'd be willing to do it if, if no one else wants to. Thank you. No. I'll defer to seniority. Um, when you're not in the room, you get appointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you I'm fine that. with that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, University Extension Office. Good morning, everyone. I see on the agenda you have um, the consideration for the county membership to the uh, Wisconsin Ex Extension Association, WEXA. So I don't know if that has to be discussed or it, everybody's familiar with the association. I would move that we extend our membership in the WEXA and pay the $50 Second. All right. Any discussion? Hearing none. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion uh, accepted or carried. Yeah. What's that? Oh, she carried. Did that work? <laughs> um, extension reports. Uh, I just have a, just a brief one. Uh, the extension educators are continuing to telecommute and they probably will be doing that through the month of June. Um, the Madison Extension is actually working uh, with a team to uh, look at transitioning back into our offices. Uh, so that's uh, the update that we have right now. Do you have any questions on that? If not, uh, Jane is going to give an uh, overview of what's going on in 4-H. Well, it's definitely a different year than the normal. So things are a little, little different, but we are trying to really work hard to stay connected and support the youth and the volunteers that are part of the Ozaki County 4-H program. And I met with all of the club group leaders and talked about any concerns they had and the impacts that COVID is going to have on 4-H. Um, obviously, we can't foresee the future, but right now they are working really hard to keep their youth connected. A number of them are leading virtual meetings and really even the project meetings, some of those, I know one of the project leaders was teaching sewing over Skype. So it's definitely things are very creative and the volunteers are working hard to keep their their projects and their clubs and their groups going and and meanwhile we're also moving a number of our trainings to a virtual format so our annual leader training was held virtually this year we have one more that we'll be holding on july 11th as is our um, volunteer and preparation training has moved to a virtual format so we can continue to move forward with those types of training supporting our volunteers adult and youth and uh, we are also um I'm working at the on a, at the state level on developing smart goals and handouts that go along with like support materials for our charters that every chartered group, basically club and group and 4-H is a chartered group and they every year have to fill out a yearly application. It's a renewal process for their charter and part of that is creating smart goals or an educational plan and that was an area that a number of the Ozaki County clubs and groups had asked for help or assistance with. So the work that I'm doing on that committee will also benefit the Ozaki County and that's going to be released, should be this, this week or next week. It's early June because we're hand, sending out all the new um, forms for those annual renewals. So I'm, I'm excited about that because it, it benefits across the state, but it's also something that supports the work and the assist the volunteers and the youth in our county. 
Does anyone have any questions? Doesn't seem so. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're um, welcome. Registry. Has, has anybody heard anything from Registry Blue? But no, I'm sorry. All right. They did have a report. They're having a bang up here. Yeah, I saw that one. I can ask them to attend there. the next meeting. I was going to do that this time. Right. Thank you. Um, all right. Andy, land and water. All right, if I stand in the middle here? Yeah, you can sit down there. We've been in the same room a number of times. Yeah. Basically, the agenda this morning is basically reports, so I had a few things I thought I would just give you an update on real quickly. The first is our Edgewater flood hazard mitigation project. Um, as you know, we completed a, a grant application on the behalf of the town of Grafton to the state DNR for the municipal flood control grant. That's to acquire these parcels here from two property owners. It's roughly two and a half acres. And I got a real positive read from DNR that it ranks very high and it's likely to get funded. And on Sunday I heard from the Wisconsin Division of Emergency Management. It looks like we're also going to be getting federal funding too. It's looking really well. I was real happy and pleased to to learn that. I have to tell you the staff at the Wisconsin Division of Emergency Management are just excellent. They're, she mentioned to me that um, applications were being taken in for this money that they had available and she mentioned oh, if none come in on Friday, any additional ones come in on Friday, I'll let you know over the weekend and she did. And they're very dedicated. I just wanted to say that. It was it's very good to work with them. So this project is looking really well. And then we also, last, at our last meeting, I talked about our crimper that we have to crimp cover crops. I thought I'd show you a picture. Mike Paulus, we, we purchased this little trailer. It's kind of a low profile, easy wagon, they call it. Mike Paulus, one of the farmers, he's really good at fabricating steel, metal. And he put, on, put some brackets on this trailer and it's real easy to transport. The crimper has been utilized uh, last weekend by the Cedar Creek Farmer Group. Brian Peters uh, crimped roughly about four acres of rye cover crop for pumpkins. He did it a little too early though. The rye has to be in a stage where it's flowering. And it wasn't in that flowering stage yet, but he felt he had to get his pumpkins in. And so some of it bounced back up, bounced back up, you know. And then I got a call late yesterday afternoon from a farmer from the West Bend area and he wants to crimp roughly about 25 acres of rye on a field where he planted some corn. And then Matt Winker is planning on using it uh, early next week. Then I have another farmer that might use it as well. So it's going to be getting some use and we're learning, which is kind of neat. Then I wanted to mention with our interseeder planter, we again are, are leasing a tractor this year from Farmers Implement out of Ellington. And we also have several farmers that are willing to do the planting. We're charging the farmers $14 an acre and they have to provide the gas. But the whole idea is to have this piece of equipment ready on the go because we have a limited time frame in which we can do this interseeding into the standing corn. So, the, so that's in the works. And then we also applied to the Fund for Lake Michigan for that $10,000 worth of seed. That's looking real positive too, but the board hasn't met yet to make their, their final decision. And then I, I wanted to mention that um, this coming week we're, we have our pollinator. We sold pollinator plants this year and we sold roughly well, close to 5,500 plants, and those are going to be picked up next week at the highway department. And then we have a Clean Farm Families meeting tentatively scheduled for Thursday evening with our farmer group. And we're actually looking at expanding the, uh, the farmer group to be a county-wide group instead of just the Milwaukee River watershed. I've had several farmers over the several years say we really should try to expand that group so we can be included. So I talked to the Wisconsin Department of Ag and they said, yes, we can easily do that. So we'll talk about that more at our meeting Thursday night. And then I should just mention, you may have heard on the news about this house on 108 Lakeshore Road that's right on the edge of the bluff. I, I have some pictures of it. 
Lake Michigan bluff erosion is very dynamic. Uh, in this area here, the erosion rate is roughly about three feet a year, approximately. I did hear from the owner of this property this week. Um, we're working with him because of the issue regarding the existing holding tank on the property. Our department works with folks to make sure that these systems are properly abandoned. And um, if they do actually leave the property and demo it, he certainly will work with us and get that site abandoned. Uh, on this site here, um, it's actually quite a distance. Here's, here's Lake Michigan, here's the home. It just so happens that the Lake Michigan Bluff is kind of skirts this area here. I looked at some aerial photography. That house wasn't built until roughly 1963. And just over time, you know, the erosion creeped in. Uh, the owner mentioned to me that just overnight, a, a big chunk for quite a distance in that area fell to the bottom, which isn't really unusual uh, in, in that area. Our department does work with landowners through our shoreline and floodplain ordinance. We have a Lake Michigan building setback from the bluff, and it's based off of the height of the bluff and the angle of repose. And the setback is right now calculated at a distance of a setback. If, if you were to have a two and a, half, two and a half to one slope and project it back, that's where that setback is for a new structure. Right or wrong, that's what we have now. And I know there's been talk about maybe in the future we need to revisit that and, and see if that's really the, the correct um, way to proceed. Andy, what's our financial um, say you work with the landowner? Is there some financial assistance or is there a financial liability to the county for this issue of blocking by another supervisor in terms of uh, opportunity cost of spending money, for example, on on a park versus assisting owners with problems like this. I mean, so I'm just trying to understand what the legal lay of the land is uh, with regard to financial uh, for Lake help or liability. For Lake Michigan Bluff erosion, we have not provided funding for assistance for erosion control. It's such a huge dynamic process and I've seen folks attempt to do projects to stop bluff erosion, and I would have to say, just from my experience, a lot of what's been done are band-aids. They, they may slow it a little bit, but over time, it seems like it tends to erode again. So we're not, we're not at the county level, we're not spending any money on work towards bluff stabilization that we provide to any private landowners. How about the idea of the tanks? You said you were working with them, the tanks, I assume that's from your comment that that was technical uh, assistance uh, or is there some financial help there in terms of preventing the pollution from that? From oh, that we, have the, we have the sanitation ordinance that our department administers and one of the items in that ordinance is to properly abandon septic systems and we require that a permit be obtained for, for that. So basically what it means is they get a permit when they are ready to abandon the system uh, it's required that one of our staff be present. Typically what we do then is uh, have the landowner pump the septic tank and typically if it's a concrete tank, we basically just collapse the tank and, and fill it in. This is just to ensure that all these systems are properly abandoned. But the landowner is financially responsible. Yes. We provide the technical oversight and assures that it has happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Andrew? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just uh, wanted to comment too. I, I like Andy, has all, have also been um, talking with this landowner and I did a fair amount of research and also actually brought this situation to our state coastal hazards work group. So just to add what, what uh, Andy already said, um, with regard to, to programs, um, really there, there is a program, it's, it's not well used um, but there is a buyout program um, through the Wisconsin Emergency Management 
the reason it's not well used is is generally the timing. So it's it's very similar in nature to um, what Angie just mentioned with regard to um, uh, flood control and uh, and the uh, if you will the, the volunteer buyouts there um, for um, uh, properties within the floodway. So um, this can also be used in this case as a hazard. I did talk to Wisconsin Emergency Management and others at the Coastal Hazards Work Group about it. Um, and so it is a possibility. The problem is that funding takes a while to uh, come about. And so oftentimes the landowners are in, um, you know, more urgent need of uh, needing to move on with um, uh, the issues or the, the house, um, et cetera. But there is, there is that program. Um, and again, um, uh, value and appraisals are always a, an issue with those properties along the bluff. Um, the other thing I would just add and mention, um, I had a lot of discussions with um, DNR staff as well as our coastal hazards work group. This property actually has a fairly long history and Andy probably knows and remembers this, but uh, this property had been filled and um, efforts to uh, shore up erosion had occurred before actually a fairly large grading and fill project. And that that has to do a lot with what was just seen. Um, essentially that 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 uh, stabilization project, if you will, lasted a long time, but this latest event was basically that that, uh, that project uh, slumped away. So this wasn't um, this wasn't native bluff. This was actually filled bluff that re-slumped. So I just want to clarify that because it was a very dramatic um, and large area, um, but it was it was largely a, a re-slump of that area. And um, DNR had been involved, and I'm sure Andy remembers that too a while back. But um, there, there's a, a long history to this property. So Andrew, is, is the landowner aware of the program you just referred to and uh, do you know if they're going to take advantage of that? Yeah, I did tell them. Um, I don't, he, at the time I talked to him, you know, he was still concerned about moving out of the house and dealing with other things. I haven't talked to him since, so I don't know. Um, I also did though convey that to Wisconsin Emergency Management. They, they said, as Andy has stated, you know, they're great staff. They said they would work with us, but I don't know if he was going to take advantage of it. My guess was was not because he was more. Um, there was some urgent uh, urgentness to what what he was trying to resolve, but but maybe things have settled down now. I don't know. I can follow yeah, up. I'm not, as long as the, the landowner is aware of it, if there's not a county responsibility to make that connection, then I think we fulfilled our duties uh, in that regard. Yeah. I, not to get into the landowner's personal matters, but he also he does have a buyer potentially for the property, and it's someone who actually specializes in bluff stabilization, and that may happen. It may not happen. He said if the, if that does fall through, he was looking at uh, vacating the the property and demoing it. Very nice man, and he's very very willing to to work with everybody. How far is this house off the shore of Lake Michigan? So what I guess I'm saying is how much of a chunk is off? Well, actually from the water's edge, it's roughly, I believe it's roughly about 300 feet from the water's edge of Lake Michigan, which isn't uncommon. A lot of these bluffs are right, you know, they're almost vertical. And then you have this large land mass between the water and, and the bluff. Uh, this landowner told me that the, actually that evening when he heard, he, he was in the house, him and his wife, and he heard a kawoomph, and he said they looked and, you know, a big chunk of the bluff let go, and he said it wasn't just his property, but it was beyond his property, and it moved to the, I believe he said to the south and north, and if you look at that area, you can see a lot of the exposed natural soil, you know, did let go in that area. And it's not uncommon, the soil composition in these areas is you have the heavy clay soil and then you have these sand lenses too. So you get the water that can percolate down, it hits the sand layer and then it wants to move out laterally and it makes us, you know, like a slick and slide. It just 
slides off the bluff. I've been out many years ago out with emergency management. They gave us a tour of the, the bluff. You could actually see the water kind of spouting out the side of the, the bluff. It's very interesting. At what point does like the county have to come in and, and tell them they have to leave the house or condemn the house or something like that? Is there such a process for that? You know, I've never experienced that. In this case, the town of Grafton actually stepped forward and mentioned to them that they need to remove, a, I guess there's an oil tank there. The town of Grafton stepped in and issued some, some orders to, to remove things. So... I think that would be a little I think so too. Yeah. yeah, typically, typically raising orders and things are at the town town level. Another thing I wanted to mention just before I'm done here is we have our Ozaki County Demonstration Farm Network. And at our last meeting, uh, you approved of the contract with NRCS. I just wanted to let you know I'm working with in-depth agronomy I to, to possibly hire them as a project manager. They're actually out of Manitowoc. They're actually serving as the project manager for the newly formed group, which is called In Between the Lakes, which includes a demonstration farm in Calumet County, Sheboygan, um, Fond du Lac, and I think Manitowoc County. And they're gonna be serving as a project manager for that. I, told, I spoke with Steve Hoffman. He's the president of that small company. And he was very, very excited to know that possibly he would have the opportunity to be the project manager. And I've talked to other farmers and other people, and he's highly respected. Um, I think we'll be real fortunate if we do get him to be our project manager. So next month, it's likely I will have a contract for you to review and take action on with in-depth agronomy. And I want to make sure that the farmers feel really good about this because he's going to be working directly with these farmers. So. I'm hoping I can have a meeting with him and his staff with the farmers and kind of get a nod from the farmers, yay or nay, whether or not we should move forward. That, that's all I have this morning. I've got a couple of quick slides. I'm just looking at your report on um, Perry Chasm Home Association, their request. I'm quite familiar with that area. That extremely hard access. It's very So it looks like there's nothing you're going to be able to help them with. Is there a major problem? Well, I, I met with the president of the Homeowners Association last fall. Access is really challenging. All they have is a footpath. footpath. And what they have is they have a, a, a little, like a little stream that outlets into Lake Michigan. And where the stream comes into Lake Michigan, it's, the bank is eroding. And, it's, and right above the bank, I mean, it's a, it's a big bluff area. That whole area is very steep. And he called looking for some help, so I met and looked at it. And I told him I would always keep it in the back of my mind and look for some special funding opportunities for a project like that where we could try to stabilize the, the uh, shoreline area. My goal is to have somebody who special, a contractor who specializes in this type of work. I'm hoping to do that somewhat soon. Is to have somebody walk down with me and talk about how would you, how would you recommend getting your equipment down here. It would be a very expensive project, but we're trying the best we can to provide some technical assistance for, for them. They're also looking for some monies and we do have monies that are available for shoreline erosion, so we'll have to, to see. So that's kind of in the works, in the works, but it is very challenging. Okay. So and the water that's coming through Fish Creek, the Bay down there, that's where they had the flooding in 97. Oh, okay. And that was very detrimental. I mean, that's our Ward 6 of Village of Bayside, which is in Lake uh, County. Yes. The, uh, the district, I believe. I, just from being there and seeing, I don't know how you would ever help them as far as getting in there. But what's it going to do? Is it collapsing that, that well, it's, it's going to cause a problem? It's basically cutting back. And the more you let it keep cutting back and you have this steep slope, the further back it gets, the larger the slope. You know, the more area that's going to start eroding. And they're concerned about the whole bluff. In, in that area, and rightly so. I mean, it's eroding. It's a natural thing that's happening. 
but people certainly want to protect their property, and it's owned by the homeowners association, so it makes it a little more challenging. And then just to the west of that private parcel is property that was owned years ago by the Nature Conservancy, a fairy chasm. It's, it's of statewide significance, I believe, as a natural area. And, and, if, and the Nature Conservancy then gave that property over to the Ozaki Washington Land Trust. Now it appears that the Ozaki Washington Land Trust property is okay. They're not that concerned about the erosion on, on their property. My thought was maybe we could marry the two groups together and have more success getting funding. So it's all kind of in the works yet. But it's a beautiful area. It's really nice. Okay, yeah, I have a couple quick questions. Go back to you talked about these pollinator plant sales, right? What are pollinator plants? Just a lot of the flower pollinator plants, we're, we're looking at prairie plants, basically. Uh, I'll just read off some names and see if you're familiar with them, like asters, cardinal flower, columbine. A lot of the flowers that, uh, plants that are flowering this time of year, a lot of those are considered pollinator type plants. Purple, like purple uh, coneflower, prairie coneflower, rattlesnake master. My other question was, you talked about with the Cripper, you talked about a farm in West Bend. Are we lending this thing out to other other counties too? Is that yeah? When we mm -hmm. yeah we we when we wrote our grant application to the Fund for Lake Michigan, we mentioned that we would try to work regionally by letting other people utilize the the Crimper. And, and it's really a good thing because there's a limited amount of farmers that are at this point in time willing to try this. It's, it's something very new. It, it was kind of cool. Yesterday afternoon I got a call from Del Moser. He's a farmer near West Bend. And he's got that 25 acres of corn. And he said, I just want to try this. He said, if we can get to the point where we can actually crimp clover instead of using a herbicide, it's going to be much, a much better way to go. So. I also had a call last fall from somebody in Fond du Lac County too, so we'll see what happens there. But it, it's, it's, it's real exciting. We're also still working with the um, uh, person from the state of Maryland, from the USDA Agricultural Research Service, on interseeding. We have several plots we're going to put in the county here, and she ordered the seed. The seed arrived last week. We're working with Bob Roden. Uh, the Malachar farm and uh, Matt Winker to put in some interseeding plots that she's going to evaluate. Like I had mentioned, she's interested in breeding, breeding more shade tolerance into some of these plants. So that'll be another fun project for us to work and learn from and have some professional ex expertise. So things are moving along, and we're doing pretty well with our sanitation and zoning permitting, even amongst this COVID-19 business. That hasn't really slowed up either. Bruce, I've got a couple of Robert, are you done? I am done, yes. Uh, a couple of questions. One of them I'm kind of embarrassed to ask uh, after you know, serving two years on this committee, but it dawned on me you used two different terms that I was kind of seeing synonymous before, but maybe I'm mistaken. So uh, we're hiring a project manager for the uh, demo farm demonstration farm project. How does that overlap with the clean farm families? I'm, I mean, with their, yeah, their, their, I thought they were, I was seeing them as the same, but they're not, I guess. Well, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're not. Um, the Ozaki Demonstration Farm Network is a USDA program, basically. And we were fortunate to be able to work with NRCS and they, and they provided funding to us. And the Clean Farm Families Group started back in 2016. That was initiated really from the Wisconsin Department of Ag. They started providing grant funds to form these producer-led groups. But in all reality, when we have our Clean Farm Families meeting, we also invite the Ozaki County Demonstration Farm Network farmers to the meeting too. And it's it's, you're, I don't want to say your confusion or your, your question. It's a good question because it's confusing. It's confusing for farmers because we'll be having our Clean Farm Families meeting and 
some of the network farmers are voting, but really don't have the authority to vote because it's a clean farm families meeting. But, but the more reason to have just one um, large clean farm families group at least. But yeah, they're, they're two separate. We get federal funding for the demo farm network and then we get state funding for the clean farm families. All doing the same thing. Uh, and then and the second question is maybe a, a larger topic, maybe to be saved for another moment, but uh, I just wanted to put it out there. Uh, my question is on the progress of the land and, and water management plan, which we postponed. Yes. Uh, and then yesterday, we, the county board, approved the TMDL or adopted the TMDL for Newburgh and Fredonia. And, and I'm just one of our nay votes, our only nay vote, was from the guy I, I figured would, would absolutely support it. So, so in talking to him afterwards, he raised the point that his vote was more or less, how, how do we make sure that the TMDL plans, the non-key element plans that are going to be coming down the line get, get folded in to the land and water management plan so that, so that really a lot of the work that, that is, is being that can be accomplished to have an impact is the stuff that you're doing that you just described, uh, the clean farm families, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so I guess I'm looking for your, your thoughts on that. I mean, we have a little bit of time with your, your time today, and, and that may be a more extensive discussion, and if it's a more extensive discussion, maybe we, we could put it off to another, another committee meeting, uh, but, but that is of interest. Yeah, I apologize. I was hoping to attend uh, that meeting yesterday as well and provide some input. I had a, we had our staff meeting, but it, not to make any help. What, what's happening is um, Sewer PAC is developing our land and water resource management plan. I spoke with Sewer PAC about how we need to take the nine key element plan and put it, you know, take parts of it and put it into our land and water resource management plan for items that we can implement. And with that nine key element plan, that was done by Applied uh, Ecological, a consulting firm. And it's a very, it's a, it's a good plan. And at our last advisory committee meeting, when the plan was finalized, the group said, well, you know, okay, the plan is done, now what? And um, it was felt that somebody needs to kind of take the lead and keep the group together and work towards implementing the various aspects of it because there's things in the plan that our department wouldn't be responsible for. There's things in the plan that Andrew's department would be involved with and so on and so forth. So anyhow, uh, I, I, I said I would take the lead on trying to keep the group together and with this COVID-19, I wasn't able to yet have a, a good meeting. but. But our goal is to keep the, the advisory group together and try to keep the implementation process moving of all the different uh, aspects of, of that plan. I've been around too long and I've seen too many plans get written and approved and nothing happens. So we're, we're hoping that uh, we can keep this one alive. But certainly it does get dovetailed into our land and water plan. There's four more coming, uh, these mm -hmm. nine key element plans. So I, you know, the discussion I took away from from Supervisor Marchisi, who I respect and probably has more knowledge about this certainly than, than I do will ever have, uh, you know, express that as, a, as an important aspect of it. it's not just this plan, it's the, it's the ones that are coming downstream and most of the impact really is going to be coming through the work that you're doing. Um, that's interesting. I don't even know what you're talking about, so I guess we have to get that on some sort of <coughs> getting ahead of ourselves um, for this group. So, you know, maybe you can discuss with him or you can talk to him, whatever, set up some sort of uh, information that we could have so that we all understand because if we spend time for you to really explain it to me, we'd be here until I really get it. So, yeah. why don't you do that? Why don't you just kind of let us know what it is so that we're all informed yeah, and, and, and that's naturally going. To, that's naturally going to happen as because I have to present the land and water plan to you, and that's going to happen in the very near future. 
Swerpak did ask for a plan extension, and I did reach out to the Department of Ag to see if they are willing to give us maybe a month or two extension, because our, our goal was to have the plan done by July, by July, <laughs> and, and we're not near near to that point. So, so that will naturally happen. I'll have it on the agenda where you're going to learn more about the nine key element plan as well as the land and water plan. That plan has to get approved by you, and then it has to go on to the state and then to the full county board. Thank you. Good luck with everything. Yeah. Andrew? You're out, thank you. Now, this, this first item, are we going to... Couple minutes? Yes. What's up? We're trying to take a vote to the table, right? I, I don't think you need to do that. I think we're just not going to present it. No need to discuss. <laughs> All right, so we have to discuss it. Increase your input. You all saw the email I sent yesterday, I'm assuming? That's pretty good. They gave us pretty much time there. Right. We're thankful for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, Andrew. Yeah. Two. Uh this is a increase of revenue. We received a, a grant from Bird City just to um, do some uh, joint work. We're um, actually working towards prairie restoration, uh, a second phase out at Vermont Park and actually actively doing the same at Tendic. Uh, this small grant was just to um, provide some uh, habitat for cavity nesting birds. So we're gonna be putting up some bird boxes and, and doing monitoring. Um, so that's primarily what this uh, small grant was for, but it matches nicely with uh, the other restoration work that we're doing at those two parks. I would make a motion as recommended in Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Motion carries. Number three. Um, source folks. Yes, this is an increase in revenue also for a grant we received from the Natural Resource Foundation. It's their go outside fund. Um, this is uh, work that we had done before, actually, uh, education and outreach as part of our larger US EPA grant. Um, that grant has now um, finished out and we've closed that out, but we have this opportunity to continue uh, what we are doing as far as education and outreach, primarily at Vermont County Park. And we're partnering with um, Schlitz Audubon Nature Center, uh, mainly because they had availability and willingness to do so. So we bring kids in and um, we talk about all the restoration aspects that we're uh, accomplishing at Vermont. So the prairie restoration, but also uh, invasive species and some of the other work that we're doing uh, at Vermont. So um, this, this small grant again, just largely pays to, uh, to fund um, bringing those school kids in. So the busing, the work with uh, SANC and, and their staff. Okay, do I have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion? Just, just a, a, a sure. kind of a general one. Uh, so, in a number of these uh, grants, you know, trying to keep track of all the grants is, continues to be a, a challenge for my limited mental capacity. Um, and so, you know, here we're, we're saying we're going to accept the, you know, we're going to do a budget amendment to move that money into our, our accounting system. Uh, and we're going to leverage a pending Brookby Foundation grant. So, you know, it, it, it's tough to know whether we're gonna get it or we're not. I mean, I have confidence based on our history that we're going to get, you know, whatever you say is pending and is going to be leveraged, but, but there's a leap of faith there. So I, I guess I'm just looking for some, some additional accounting mechanism. Uh, what you did with the, uh, the uh, Clay Bluffs uh, account, that $500 is probably not worth it, but, but some mechanism to, to show you know, what's pending, what's the timeline, what, you know, so that we can evaluate the risk when we do things like this. Here it's a, it's a budget amendment, I get that, but it's based on, we're accepting it based on a pending grant. So I'm just, 
a general plea for how capturing that somehow as we're doing these things. I know the grant uh, worksheet that was implemented six months ago is, is a huge help, uh, but there's still some missing piece of it, I think, when we, when we do something like this. So, so anyway, I'm going to go for it. I just wanted to put that out there in the course of this discussion. Yeah, so I mean, it is, it is a timing thing because all these uh, obviously have different timelines for uh, application and award and, and some of them have a much more protracted between application and award than than others. Um, having said that, you know, we're very cautious always to um, uh, kind of if if you will have have backup plans as well. So in this particular case, um, we have the required match secured. Um, there is no no issues. Um, but oftentimes we're trying to lay out the full picture for you, as you mentioned. And so going back to the budget worksheet, when we present the grants that we're applying for, uh, that's supposed to be the full gamut of kind of uh, the overall project. So it will also talk about some of these other, other aspects. In fact, the Bird City grant is, is one, um, the work that we're doing to do the prairie, native prairie seeding at Vermont and Tendic is another, and we've secured those funds. Um, so I can, I, and I'm glad to provide those updates, you know, as these come about with these increased revenues, but uh, we have no risk on this one. We have all of our secured match in accepting this as well as the Bird City one. Um, but we try and give you the full picture of all the grants that are um, towards a given project. So the Brookby is part of that, but is not necessary as um, uh, match in this. And, and again, that grants, budget spreadsheet we don't um we, we didn't put back in the packet um but but that's supposed to give that overall picture yeah i, I understand that and you know certainly for 500 dollars or so, i mean I'm, this is in this is in the weeds i'm not but it's a symptom of a larger issue and i think you know there's some balance between how much workload the staff has to go through to include all this information the size of the packet we have to read i get that uh we need to find. We need to continue to, to try to find that balance. There's no criticism here. This is just a, a how do we move forward, you know, so that we still have that full context. Yeah, and if there was a if there was an issue where it was a large grant and still there was large pending, which is something that's going to come up, which I'll I'll talk about here. I, I will mention it at the time of the budget amendment, and so um, that that'll that discussion will happen in regards to the Vermont staircase so I will definitely try and cue you in on those that uh, you know we we don't uh, we talked about some pending match and that pending match may be required you know as part of accepting um, another grant so I'll try and cue you in on that I, I just because of the timing it, it's very complicated as far as you know lining up all the different grants and so I don't always have those those answers at any given time. I think Bruce has a, a good point here, um, especially in financial times where we don't know where the governments are going to be or these uh, uh, other uh, foundations and that um, are going to be financially that maybe a little more information to, to tell us where um, we could lose out and, and cost the county, you know, would be informative, I guess. Let me, let me try saying this a different way. Um, we've never, in these grants, we've never asked to increase our budget. So we use our existing leveraged in-kind approved budget. We've never come back and asked for an increase on, on any project. Um, we seek out additional funds and we also, one important thing is oftentimes with these grants, we're able to scale them. And so that's something I'm going to talk about um, with, with the next project. But I know I, I, I hear what you're saying and I will try and provide as best and current and more information that I can about these things. But I have not uh, intentionally do not put the county at risk. I do not put us in a position where I have to come back and ask for county uh, funds. In fact, most of these, uh, if anything, were looking for additional grant funds at some th at some point to to complete the project. And so, and I realize that that is a risk, and I'll try and identify that. But 
a lot of times we have the ability to either scale this or we've received those pending funds in between, you know, application and award. So right. I'll try and do my best to point that out. That information was included when this was approved. It was previously in a packet. Now I think it happened in February, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. So you know, you obviously you were the chair of the committee, and that was some time ago. But that information is there. Okay. This is just again. This is just accounting for the grants. Where they've already been approved by the committee, approved for acceptance. Now we're just moving the money into the budgets. Just, just so we're clear. So I think even the information Bruce is looking for has been presented to the committee. I, I think it has. I, I think that was back in February when it was pending, and now this is June. Is it still pending? It seems to still be pending. So there, there is some update possibility that that exposes or reduces our risk. Again, this is $500. I, I, I'm not suggesting that we do that for such size grants, but but there's some there's some time that's gone by, and we're in a different environment, as, as the chairman said. So so having some sense of how that that time has changed, either the grants that are that are uh, still pending or not still pending, is is fair discussion. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number four, increase revenue budget amendment for existing Southeast Wisconsin Basic Stinkies Consortium Grant. Um, thank you. This is uh, an increased revenue, again, a grant that we received, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the context here as well. but. Uh, to do um, invasive species management in conjunction with the highway department uh, with, uh, within our county managed right of ways. So that would be county trunks, state trunk highways and, and I-43 or the federal. Um, so in this particular grant, um, you know, we had to go through the process to identify the exact amount because we get funded by the number of sites that we do. So we have to identify the sites that both we're eligible for and that we're going to to uh, um, to manage, and so therefore this budget re amendment reflects uh, that exact amount. Um, so again, th this is after between application and now we've sorted out exactly how many sites and the exact amount um, that the budget amendment will increase by for the number of sites we're going to treat. So this is um, again invasive species management within those county managed right of ways. And we'll be working with highway uh, to do this work. All right. I would make the motion to increase the revenue budget amendment. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. All right, motion carried. Increased revenue budget for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Joint Venture Grant Acquisition of Great Wall Cedar Gorge. Here we go. Um, did, I think we might have skipped number five. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I apologize. Management, uh, I, Coastal Water Management Program, Grant, oh, grant Acquisition. Oh, I can talk about both of these. I can talk about both of these as they're as they're related. You can take them one at a time. But um, these are two awarded grants, and again, this is just the process of amending the budget. Of course, it's still going to go to county board. So the fact that you're passing this budget amendment, it it doesn't get finalized until county board approves it. So this is just lining up all of those so that we can have that um, larger discussion and vote and consideration at county board. So, you know, your action today does does forward it because we need to, to line up, um, you know, acceptance of these grants along with that discussion. Uh, having said that, the first one is an awarded grant from the Wisconsin Coastal Management for the acquisition. Um, just as a quick reminder, because I know that uh, when we applied some, some this was different committee, 
uh, but we originally applied for a $250,000 grant. They awarded $125,000. Um, that is being matched uh, by state stewardship, which, which is pending. Um, and then, and this was talked about in our, our larger discussions. Uh, the second one is just um, our existing accepted US Fish and Wildlife Joint Venture Grant. This is the one we already have. We didn't amend the budget at the time um, because of timing with um, uh, the budget, et cetera. So we're, we're doing that now. This is really a formality. That grant is the one that has been accepted and the county has set aside $200,000 for the match for this grant. Having said all of that, um, you know, these are just the, the budget amendments to get them to county board for the larger discussion and, and the votes and the consideration that you need to do. So these could, uh, if, if not approved to move forward with that project, these uh, increased revenue budget amendments wouldn't go forward at that time either, but I'm needing to line them up timing wise. So that's the consideration here is um, amending the budget should this uh, get approved in, in the July discussions at County Board. All right. So uh, let's go with, I'm sorry, the first one was the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program Grant. Um, so I'll move it through. Second. second. All right. Any discussion? What does the shortfall indicate? I mean, where, where is that hole filled? Uh, between the request and the 125, were we expecting the 125? Yeah, so I mean, we're it's a, a, a bigger funding package, which I, I know we presented at county board, we'll present again. Um, but basically, the the um, whatever we cannot fund in the way of these grants is going to be coming out of uh, the land trust private fundraising efforts. Um, we do have a large pending stewardship grant actually two of them and we don't know what that amount is either so if we were to get the maximum amount that we're, we're not uh anticipating that um so again we have some built-in if you will uh buffer on on the total acquisition dollars i don't i'm i'm sorry i don't have that table with me this morning but um we will uh, go over that again at county board but it but it is a mix of uh, as many of the grant funding sources that we can get. In this particular case, the match is coming from stewardship, which is pending, and then private fundraising is making up the balance. Anything else? Do we know the total price yet? <laughs> we, we do know the total price. There is an option to purchase the the land is under contract between the land trust and um, Waukesha State Bank. And I can say that it's well under the appraised value, but that's all I can say at this point, I'm, I'm afraid. It, it's, it's not, it's not, it's uh, confidential to, to me. I, I don't, I don't know, but I can, I can say that it's well under the appraised value, which I have seen the appraisal value. else? All right. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, all right. Let's go to supporting the submittal of acceptance of the grant by Ozaki County Land Trust. No, I think we still have to um, take a motion on number six. Oh. <clears throat> He just discussed them with the two, but you still have okay, separate motion sorry. for that. We have a motion. Come on. Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? I feel like there's more information here. I, I haven't formulated my questions well enough, but. Um, One of the things that we were going to talk about, uh, or maybe was left open, was the downstream cost of improvements. And I'm, I'm a particular supporter of we'll fund them as funding becomes available through grants. I understand that, but I just wanted to, from a committee perspective, be able to speak.
speak to understand how uh, Supervisor Hero's request, I think Supervisor Marchese, you know, agreed with it and said, you know, to the degree that we can forecast it, what does that that uh, management plan look like for this area at, if it comes under county ownership? And so I'm I'm wondering, not not that we need, would need to go through that here. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm, I as we come up for a board discussion. Is that going to be part of the discussion to address those supervisors' concerns? It'll be at our mid-month meeting. Yes, uh, to 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 all the county board uh, questions that were raised. Hopefully, we have a list, and if any others are added, uh, we will have answers to all those. I can tell you that my staff is is working uh, diligently on on those um, both passive recreational use development costs restoration costs and then the operational costs so we're we're putting that package together that we'll have for um the mid-month meeting do you have a sense of the uh where the, the timing for closing on this property and where ozaki washington land trust is in the private fundraising with regards to supporting that so um including the funding that the county currently has been awarded um there is a little over a million dollars so i i don't know i don't know off the top of my head i didn't do that that delta but our 625 uh plus their fundraising a little over a million dollars is is uh the current status um so th th that that delta would be what the land trust has raised thus far um and and just to be clear about that, they actually haven't even started uh, formally their their capital campaign until just um, you know just a few days ago. So uh, we're at the very very beginning part of that. Um, with regard to the timing, and this will again uh, be uh, replaced in the the packet, but it was in the last county board packet. Uh, we anticipate, and I can't pin down the date exactly because it is a little bit dependent upon. Uh, awarding of some of these grants, but we anticipate that closing will probably be in, uh, I, I'll, I'll say maybe first or second quarter of 2021. Yeah, there's some grant awards that's extended to early 2021. Correct, Andrew? Uh, the weapons grant, the uh, stewardship grant, for example. I, I'm sorry, I missed the question. I just said there's some grant awards that extend into the next year. So final question, by accepting these grants and realizing that this still needs to go in front of the county board, but county com committees need to do their due diligence, is there financial risk in taking these into our accounting system uh, That if the deal, if Ozaki Washington Land Trust doesn't come through, if Port Washington says they don't want to do their part of it, if some other grant doesn't come through, what is the the county's fallback plan for these giving back these grants? Is there any financial risk associated with it? I'm just trying to make sure that that's we would return the monies. Yep. Any other budget budgetary line item buy down that's not spent. In this, but in this case, they'd have to be returned, obviously, to the granting organizations. Yes. Well, well, I, I just want to remind you, if we don't spend the money, we're... <laughs> it's a different situation, but the covered bridge, toilet uh, scenario is a little bit different. We'd already spent the money. Um, yeah, that was... The, the property. So I, I didn't want yeah, to find I... ourselves on something and then have to uh, somehow undo it. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I mean, J Jason's right. I mean, first of all, the budget won't get formally amended till the county board accepts those. But even even after that point, uh, if we don't use the money and we don't close on the property because we have a shortfall, um, then we would have to return the grant by the time they ex expire and or get them extended in order to, you know, secure our, our funding uh, for that. So um, we we won't we won't be able to spend the money that we have until we have the other money anyway, because we won't have 
the dollars to close. So um, minimal risk other than the fact that we would have to return grants. Um, and then uh, just to the point of covered bridge, um, that was really very different. Um, that grant was accepted way back in the 60s. Um, it was a federal grant and um, bathrooms were developed uh, as part of that grant and a requirement of that grant. And they were put in at the time of development, they were pit toilets. Uh, regulations changed over time. Those pit toilets ended up being in the floodway and the state came in and said, you can't have those pit toilets in the floodway. We had to remove them with the agreement that we would still comply with the original federal grant, which said we will have bathrooms at Cover Bridge Park. And so that's the, the dilemma that we were in, but th that grant frankly was, you know, awarded way back in well, well before my time in the sixties for that you know, that kind of um, re requirement. All right. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Um, resolution supporting the middle of the and acceptance of grants by Ozaki County Land Trust. So real quickly, I mentioned that there are two DNR stewardship grants. One, the land trust has already applied for. It's through the non-governmental organization program track of stewardship. There is a local unit of government, a LUG uh, program track also of stewardship. Uh, this particular application is through that LUG program. Normally, this would be the one that the county would apply to. Um, we get, did get kind of um, approval that the land trust could be the applicant in this case, with the condition that the county would um, uh, provide a supporting resolution that basically uh, we, would, we would accept the grant, uh, the, the, the dollars to use, be used for this project um, even though the land trust is the lead applicant on the grant and will need to do the grant reporting, et cetera. Um, again, this is a uh, part of the, the match that we just talked about the two stewardship programs together. Uh, we were encouraged to apply through both tracks because they, they tap into different funding pots um, essentially. So we are encouraged to apply through both routes um, the NGO program route and also the LUG program route. Uh, so this again is through the local unit of government tracked, but we, the, the county needs to, as the local unit of government needs to approve a resolution supporting the land trust's application saying that we will accept the grant to use it for this, this purpose and project. All right, we have a motion. I move. Rob, second. Have a second. <coughs> I'll second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none. I'm sorry, I have this. I talk a lot, so I love to go to people. The way it, I, speaking of talking a lot, this is the longest resolution I've seen. So I, I'm just, and I've got only a couple of years on the board, but yeah. has this been bounced off the, does this meet the requirements for the, the state grantors? Yeah, I apologize for the length. I know we are really trying to cut it down, but in this unique situation, because we are a supporting resolution to the land trust application, they want to know the history and also the um, so in other words the past supporting efforts that the county has undertaken to pursue this project um, as well as our planning efforts uh, identified because they rely very heavily on uh, those planning efforts um, so yes much of this um, is uh, required by the dnr and there's a little bit extra in this case because they want to identify the history because we have uh, applied for and received a stewardship grant in the past for the same project.
Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are you opposed? Motion carries. Um, the middle of acceptance of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation bringing back the native grants for lake sturgeons. Um, thank you. So um, this is a submittal of a, of a grant proposal. Um, through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which we've uh, done many times uh, pre pre previously, so we've been funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation on a number of projects. Uh, this is specifically their Bring Back the Natives program. Um, and in particular, uh, they have a priority identified for work as it relates to lake sturgeon. Uh, as you know, we currently have accepted grants um, through the Fund for Lake Michigan and also the DNR for work that we're currently doing on uh, a lake sturgeon habitat assessment. Um, that habitat assessment um, was, an, again, this is an example of kind of scaling a project uh, to, to our budget. That project was scaled in order to meet um, the funding sources that we had. Uh, we would like to complete the full project, which is which is why we're um, submitting this application. Um, it would allow us to complete the, the full length of the Milwaukee River and identify uh, lake sturgeon habitat and incorporate that into a management plan that the state DNR um, is working on as well. They're working on a lake uh, sturgeon habitat management plan for, for the Milwaukee River specifically. Uh, the state was very supportive of this. The state has funded us on our current work um, but this one is to uh, hopefully um, complete that that full full project that we had originally envisioned. Um, it is a one to one grant, uh, so we're applying for fifty thousand dollars, and you can see that um, it also requires uh, fifty thousand dollars in match funding, which is coming from some pending grants. So uh, this this does identify some level of risk. Uh, a pending grant from the Fund for Lake Michigan for 20,000. We have had those discussions with the fund. Uh, they are funding our current work. And so they're very receptive to that additional request. Um, a Wisconsin DNR River Protection Planning Grant. Again, we've had those discussions. They're very uh, supportive of a request. And Wisconsin Coastal Management Program for $20,000. Again, same situation. We've had that discussion with them. They're very supportive of that request. Um, the Fund for Lake Michigan application timeline is really uh, quarterly, so we can submit that at any quarter. Uh, River protection planning, they just change things I, uh, again with their, their timeline, but I believe those are, are gonna be um, due in fall. Um, and then the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program, that application timeline is um, November. So you would see those also coming forward as part of this overall package. But the um, Bring Back the Natives grant submittal is, is now. So we're, this, is, this is the first kind of on this, if you will, the second phase of the project. We already are doing uh, a significant amount on this. Um, if we were to receive uh, the Bring Back the Natives grant, um, we anticipate that that is a fall award. Um, we don't have the exact timeline, uh, but we would anticipate that we might not know those other pending sources at that time. So I can make that, um, you know, abundantly clear at that time uh, if we were to receive the, the Bring Back the Natives grant. Um, but, but that is, uh, in this case, that is the risk. Um, we can, we can though, however, and have done in the previously uh, funded work, uh, scaled the project. So if, um, if, if that's uh, something we need to do, in other words, we can reduce the scope uh, of the project and reduce the budget and hence reduce our required match uh, if need be. Um, but, but those are the identified risks um, in the, um, in the grant spreadsheet and, and, the, and also the sources. Uh, again, generally I tried 
to identify, you know, the likelihood of those funding sources. And uh, we've had discussions with all three agencies and um, all, all those agencies with the exception of Wisconsin Coastal Management are funding our current work. No, so um, our project is identifying all the habitat um, to the south of those two dams because we we don't anticipate those dams being removed or uh, habitat being available above there. So we're really trying to identify all the potential sturgeon habitat and likewise the next step, which is identifying potential projects to improve that habitat um, south of those two dams. So that as those are just identifiers uh, of the northernmost reach uh, that we're, Bill, we were working in. All right, so the fish are started, or the sturgeon are started up in uh, uh, Wildcott, right? Yeah, and yes. And that place, does this affect them uh, to spawn, uh, you know, will they, will they still spawn below those dams? Yeah, excellent question. So sturgeon, like a lot of other fish, are um, uh, very much honed to uh, the water that they were born and raised in. So they're very um, uh, tied to the water chemistry. Um, and so River Edge, uh, almost two decades ago now, uh, started um, rearing lake sturgeon. And by the way, they're specially permitted through the feds because only certain organizations can even do this. So State DNR and River Edge are rearing sturgeon up at River Edge Nature Center in the Milwaukee River. That water chemistry is in fact um, believed to be the same as it would be in the lower reaches of the Milwaukee River. And they've seen that success. So what they do is they they rear them up there because of the condition of the water, because of a willing partner, because they have the infrastructure now. Um, and then they, through uh, um, Sturgeon Fest, they actually then um, stock, if you will, all the sturgeon that are raised. So that's that's a large event. It used to occur down in Village of Thienesville at Village Park. Um, and that was a great, great event for us. Um, Unfortunately, I think they somewhat outgrew that. And, and also there was some concerns back in the days when we had some low waters in the Milwaukee River, there was some concerns about those um, uh, young sturgeon making their way down to the harbor uh, because we had some very low water situations. So they then moved Sturgeon Fest down to Lakeshore State Park, which is in Milwaukee, and they get stocked right into the harbor. Um, they have found a little bit higher predation because of that, but they probably have a, a less loss due to that, that downstream migration. So it's, it's kind of a mix, but the, the sturgeon then gets sto uh, uh, restocked back into the Harbor and Milwaukee River, but they were raised in that Milwaukee River water chemistry, which uh, is, if you will, the, at least the part that the sturgeon hone in on uh, is the same throughout the Milwaukee River. So they are in fact returning um, we actually just got a report from uh, the DNR that they have now just been seen uh, several, um, probably two dozen male, large male lake sturgeon uh, congregating below Clutch Dam. So they're, they're on their way back. Uh, the males are the first to return, then the females. The males are um, uh, able to breed every other year and the females uh, are, are receptive to that breeding every every four years. So there's kind of this, you know, complication there as far as uh, their life history and so forth. But anyway, they will be returning soon. And uh, 
I think you're, you're, you may all be aware, but we also currently have a project to um, modify the uh, fishway at Mequon Thienesville Dam to make it more accessible to Lake Sturgeon. Uh, and we're going through that design and engineering right now, but um, yes, the rearing should work well for them. They should spawn and return to the Milwaukee River, um, even though where they're actually raised is above these dams. Is the Milwaukee County line the southern extent of this project? Um, no, we would go into Milwaukee County to do the habitat assessment as well. Uh, and the, the next question back to finances would be, uh, I, I note that the, uh, the grant sheet says in September you're going to do the field assessment and some of the grants I thought you mentioned were may not be available until November. Uh, yeah, actually some of them we don't apply to until November. Mainly so the coastal, mainly the coastal. Is, it, it's scalable if we know what we're going to get, but once we've applied for accepted this $50,000, we're, the, the risk that you, you alluded to, we won't know until we've accepted the money and started using it, and then we're potentially putting the, the county on the hook for whatever doesn't come through from those granting organizations. Is that yeah, so this is a good example, Bruce, of what I was talking about um, earlier, but it, it really is the same thing with Clay Bluffs. So we, for, for a couple of reasons, one, not to, one, and maybe the most important for you all is that we would not put the county at risk. So even though we would accept and put this in a budget amendment, um, we wouldn't spend those bring back the native funds until the other funding came up, up on board and or we scaled the project down and got approval to do so um, in light of our budget. So um, that's, that's first and foremost. Second of all, if we don't have the match, we, the, the match dollars with all these grants um, typically need to be expended during the grant budget period. So we wouldn't want to actively start up the Bring Back the Natives grant until we had the secured match because uh, it's gotta be during that grant period. So oftentimes we do have to, because of the timing of all these grants, we do have to look at um, you know, protracted timelines for the grants that come on board first. But, we, just like Clay Bluffs, we would not start incurring any expenses on this grant uh, until we assured the funding and or a scalable project that matched our, our matching dollars. In other words, reduce the scope uh, and then subsequently have, you know, if we, if we were awarded some portion of that match. Okay, okay, thank you. Can I make a comment in support of you, Andrew, for this. Um, I used to work with Jennifer Bolger, who's the executive director of um, Milwaukee River Keeper. And so I've kind of been following this project for a while. And I just think it's very exciting. I get very excited. I've been to Sturgeon Fest and um, I don't know if anyone else on the committee has, but um, I think it's very exciting. And it's a project that I think is good for building relationship between Ozaki County and Milwaukee County. Um, through the river and, and, and that project and how we've seen that kind of creep up from downtown all the way now up here with the dam removals and repairs and all of that. So I think it's a very exciting project. Okay. Andrew, back to Bruce's point. Um, in the future, as of now, what you're saying is that we have checks and balances in place that if we don't get the best, if we don't get the funds, we don't spend the, the Ozaki County money. Correct? That's correct. And, and you said it much better than okay. I could. And, and again, in this case, there is actually no county contribution that we're anticipating either other than our approved budget. So, you know, in kind, if you will. Um, so, but yes, you said that very well. But I think I think what the, in the county board when we have the meetings with the county board, I think this is truly missed in a lot of places that people may ask questions and we spend a lot of time explaining. But truly, we're not out to 
put the people of Ozaki County in harm's way that we do have the checks and balances to take care of that situation. Yeah, as I mentioned in, in my history, I mean, since since we really started ramping up, you know, our, our grant work, um, we have never incurred or come back to the county for additional funding to, to complete a project, never. Zero times since 2009 and $17 million. So um, I can say that because we, we work within our existing approved budget and additional grants. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, the motion, second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Um, so uh, I know that we're, you know, scrutinizing purchases. So right up, right up front, I want to just say that um, all the, uh, the the cost here is borne by our enterprise fund, which is non-levy dollars. So that's first and foremost. But but second to that is we purchased the the base uh, of these trucks, if you will, the the frame, the cab, etc. Um, what this is purchasing is the um, the box, if you will, and the lift gate and those sort of things. So right now we have already purchased, we have in-house uh, the truck, the truck and the truck frame, if you will, but not the box. So we're really lo looking to make these trucks useful to us. Uh, and that's how we had originally phased this project. Um, so this is to buy those. Uh, we did uh, solicit bids um, and you can see that we're recommending uh, the low bid from Casper Truck Equipment um, for the purchase, a total of 22542 Again, those dollars being coming from our Golf Course Enterprise Fund non-levy. I would make the recommended motion. I'll second. Okay. All right, motion. Uh, is there any other discussion or any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Opposed to Jason? Oh, I think this is Andrew. Yeah, I think I think this is Andrew. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you all an update. I think I kind of did a county board, but I just wanted to allow for any questions of the committee uh, in case there's some concerns about anything that we're doing in the parks or golf courses with regard to COVID and our uh, policies and programs. So the golf courses are both uh, fully open, including the clubhouses now. We're taking extra precautions for cleaning, social distancing with our staff. Um, we had uh, kind of phased into this. So we opened the golf courses. Everything was um, just taken online or by phone. That's still the case for, for reservations. Um, uh, from there, we started using the golf carts, still a single user per cart. Um, so we went out actually just as far as uh, uh, additional cost and, and also what we're, we're doing for security is we went out and rented um, a whole bunch of additional golf carts because we simply don't have a fleet big enough now uh, you know, with only one person per cart uh, use. Uh, and the only exception there is um, family or um, people living in the same household. So um, we went out and rented additional golf carts so that we can still do it that way uh, and to, to provide the greatest security. Those golf carts get cleaned and sanitized every time in and out. Um, then we phased into opening up the clubhouses per state. Um, so we're following the CDC guideline and everything. Uh, the restaurant um, was opened uh was opened on june 1st so the restaurant will start serving and again we're doing social distancing both in the golf courses as far as uh the table layout uh you know number of chairs that kind of thing but we're also encouraging you know a lot of outside dining if you will so that people can just pick up their food uh either eat outside or eat at the turn or whatever the case may be so we're we're still trying to take um great precaution on 
on the public in the clubhouses, but they are open. Um, with regard to the parks, um, we have kept our bathrooms, our indoor flush bathrooms closed to this point. Um, my feeling right now is that we're gonna keep them closed through all of June. Um, and then we're gonna reevaluate um, going into the 4th of July weekend for the bathrooms. Um, as far as the shelters, uh, so part of that concern is, is we went out and purchased some equipment to sanitize, which we did not have. So we're getting some sanitizing equipment, which is basically a, a pressure washer, if you will, with some of that sanitizing um, fluids uh, spray. Um, with regard to the, the shelters, we just uh, started taking limited reservations of the open air shelters. So these are all open air, um, but we do still plan on, on sanitizing uh, those open air shelters, in particular the picnic tables. Um, but we just started taking those reservations here in June. Uh, bathrooms will remain closed though, so they will be using porta potties. And those porta potties, we've added additional porta potties, and they're also getting serviced more frequently. So these are all, frankly, I'm, I'm saying this also because these are all additional costs that the that we're incurring that we didn't budget for, and and we're identifying as COVID costs should any kind of reimbursement come forward. Um, uh, next, I'll, I'll just mention our HH Peters Youth Camp, which we often rent out to, um, you know, corporate outings, weddings, uh, other private parties, as well as scout groups, uh, all kinds of uh, community groups. Uh, we have remained closed. We don't anticipate opening that. We're also going to revisit that in July. The only exception to that is we do have a WIS core team, a conservation core team that's coming to help us plant trees and do some invasive species work under our grants. Uh, we need, as part of our contract with them, we provide them lodging. We are not gonna have them stay in the lodge. They're gonna camp on the grounds, but we are gonna open up the bathrooms for them. And we'll have our sanitizing equipment at that time so we can sanitize the bathrooms. Um, it will be a little extra work for our staff, but we're also gonna put some of this on the core because they're gonna be the exclusive user of those bathrooms. We can isolate it to just them so that they will be responsible for cleaning uh, in, in between their stay, if you will, or while, while they're there staying. Uh, we're only gonna open up the bathrooms, like I said, not the lodge. Right now we're gonna keep the lodge closed until July and then reevaluate also. Um, all of our playgrounds remain closed uh, until we can get the sanitizing equipment. We're anticipating that same timeline until July and then reevaluate for the playground equipment. Um, all the parks, trails, um, otherwise are, are open and, and we're continuing to, to manage social distancing and the use of the parks, which has been uh, extensive, <laughs> um, and particularly at Lion's Den Gorge, uh, where we've seen and have counts now to show a, actually a doubling uh, in usage just in the month of April, and we don't have counts for May yet. But um, so I will be meeting with the Grafton Fire Chief uh, tomorrow, this Friday. They have some concerns. You may have heard on the news that we did have an issue out at Lion's Den. Uh, somebody's dog uh, got down the bluff, and they went to go rescue him and got stuck on the bluff, and were had had to get rescued by Grafton Fire Department. Uh, this has been an ongoing conversation with the Grafton Fire Department. I've been trying to keep them in the loop. We've been trying to, to manage with them as best we can with all of their suggestions. We've placed no parking signs. We've tried to manage parking. We've put in gravel shoulders uh, over time, et cetera. Um, but we're going to be meeting again tomorrow to talk about some additional things because when that park was parked up, they had a hard time getting their uh, fire truck in there. And it's the it's their piece of equipment that they need to use. It's the one that's fully stocked for bluff rescue, et cetera. So they need to be able to get that in. And so we're gonna try and do some initially low cost modification to uh, the, the layout of both the parking and, and a little bit of the configuration of the road to allow them better access. We're gonna be looking at that tomorrow. Um, but I do anticipate that we might have to do something more substantial in the coming years with regard to um, th that park entrance, the, the, and, and particularly some pinch, pinch points uh, that we might need to improve so that they can get access. Um, so I just wanted to, to share that as well. 
So um, I think I, I covered everything, but I, I just wanted to let you know where we were with, you know, keeping things open and stuff. We are working um, towards an online reservation program for all of our park shelters, et cetera. Um, that was supposed to be incorporated as part of our uh, golf course software update. Um, that's a slow process with the golf course software. So we're kind of taking uh, our own steps to do an interim uh, um, online reservation. My staff's working on it internally and uh, hopefully being able to take uh, payments by PayPal. So we are working towards that. It is a process, but we have still been taking most of our reservations over the phone. Uh, they can download, download forms off the uh, website and mail them in. So that has been mostly remote. Um, for reservations and we'll continue to do that and, and hopefully improve the access to that via online. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of where we stand with, with, um, with kind of what, how we're managing uh, both reservations, the golf courses and uh, facilities at the parks. I don't, I don't know if there's any questions, but I did want to give you that update. Anything else? Any questions? One question, and, and I hesitate to go here because I use this as an example of things county board supervisors should not be talking about. But we had a man stand up and talk uh, talk about uh, I think was it playgrounds and the uh, and the uh, the barriers that, that are there. So you said you're going to revisit that in July or maybe the tail end of June. Uh, what are the conditions that are going to change that would make you change your on that I mean is it uh, yeah so we're we're following I've been talking to Kirsten at public health so we're following that but more importantly is our staffing and our ability to effectively sanitize uh, the playgrounds and so we have that we've been having that equipment on order for a while now we still haven't received it but we are anticipating that that's going to be delivered in mid-june so that's a big part of it uh, the other is staffing um, most of our, we aren't usually fully staffed in the parks until uh, June. Uh, we were there and then we had a few uh, people quit. So we're hoping to get staffing because frankly, um, you know, we're at capacity as it is with uh, bathroom cleaning, et cetera. So it really has to do with being able to manage that effectively. Andrew, I'm right by Vermont Park and um, you know, I'm friends with several moms in the neighborhood and for whatever it's worth, I, it, the, the sense I get is that everyone who I've talked to is okay with um, you know, it, you, it, time going by and um, waiting until it's safe and you're able to clean everything properly. That, that's great to hear and, and know. Yeah, we've had a few conversations, but that, that, thank you. Vermont is one of the playgrounds that use, is used the heavily, heavily mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and it's been very busy over there. Yes, yes, Vermont is another very busy. Actually, they all have seen such increased traffic. So, so that's the primary uh, primary thing, Bruce. Uh, it, those those changes in being able to effectively clean and sanitize some of these things for opening, but also following tracking the cases and so forth. Um, so. Okay, thank you. I, I, one last thing I, I will mention, we did, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, but we did open up the tennis courts. Those were closed. We did open those up. Uh, we just are posting signs that saying encourage single play. Now we're not going to be out there enforcing it. So if somebody goes out and plays doubles, uh, you know, with a family member or whatever, we're not going to enforce that, but we are encouraging, you know, singles play, but we did open up the tennis courts. And um, the other thing I forgot, I forgot to mention, but camping is also open but we have not turned on the water to the public yet. So the bubblers uh, are not active, et cetera. We will provide hookup directly to a trailer if they have such a hookup um, with water, but we don't have any public water available. And, and same, same timeline on those. So that guy was giving false information yesterday about the, the fencing taken away from the Playground, is that? Well, uh, uh, my understanding was he talked to a maintenance worker and said, yeah, I could get this done in five minutes, yeah. 15 minutes or whatever, but, but it wasn't uh, done, right? was it? My understanding There's still was, fenced up. Okay. My understanding was that certain municipalities, their parks are, are doing other things than what our county parks are doing as 
far as playgrounds. And that's where the conflict comes. That is true. And just so you know, I, I'm talking with uh, our park directors and actually directors around the state on all these issues almost weekly. Uh, so I, I try and keep, you know, up uh, coordinated on, on where everybody is at. But, but yeah, some people have different, slightly different phasing programs. I'm trying to be conservatively cautious about our openings. So I'll make, I'll make a comment. It's a, it's a challenge to keep these playgrounds. You know, I mean, you, you sanitize them, and five minutes later, they're contaminated. So it's not good, you know, right? You've yes. been doing that. I know Deansville um, was opened the day after the Supreme Court. That's my consternation. Our village president wants to put the barricades down and stuff like that. So um, we talked at the, at the village level on what to do with for our park. and. Playgrounds open, and I was trying to get some signage. So I think we're probably going to get some hand sanitizer stations put up around there. But it's you know there's there's a lot of different different opinions about this. So. All right, Thank, go ahead. Thanks, Rob. I just you reminded me too. We did order uh, a, a number of hand sanitizers that we're going to be putting in all of our park shelters and nearby the playgrounds. All right, I have a comment. Um, I know you probably think that I'm kind of rushing this. I'm not rushing this whole meetings, all these meetings, but I do have a different uh, style in my management. And my, my feeling is, is that if we could, if you have questions to Andrew or Andy or anybody else, at least bring them forward to them prior to the meeting so that they can come with a concise answer and they don't feel like they're on, you know, on the, um, that they got to give you, they don't know what their question is going to be and they, they may not have the answer and they may give a longer um, statement than they need to give. So if they can, if you can get those questions to them earlier, so that they can give you a concise answer and not have to uh, maybe grasp the words or whatever. Of course, there's questions that come up as they're talking. I have, yeah, yeah. That's, I'm not yeah. talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, like uh, Bruce was bringing up the financial end of it. If we could just get that forward and then come and ask a question and they're prepared, that's what I'm looking at. So if we could work on that, you know, we could, we can make it more uh, sure, sure. All right. Uh, next meeting Thursday, July second. Uh, I'm going to be out of town, so I don't know if it's good for. I mean, uh, should we stay with the hot spot? I could, I could do this meeting on a hot spot, but I won't be coming down for this meeting. So otherwise, Bar could, could take over. I've chaired before. Yeah. Quite a few times in the last year. Is that all right? I don't yeah. Because that'll be after. I hope they can be there. What's that? I was going to drop your hotspot off tonight, so okay. we have a, a rental one for you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's just, can we go back a second just to the, the questions and running of the meetings? Is, is there going to be an opportunity for, I mean, one of my, my, short histories with this committee is that we deal with all of the issues that get presented for us and it's a, it's a long time and you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's not driven at all by the committee it's driven by the staff and responsiveness to, to the, the policy requirements right. that they have and I'm just wondering if there's if there's a value or an opportunity for us to as a committee to say what are the things we want to see worked on in this committee that, that don't get necessarily raised by the, the staff. And so things like, I know strategic planning has is, is, is been set aside for a little bit, but there's other issues out there too, like the TMDL versus the land and water plan and other things like that, that may, maybe there's an opportunity for us to have a discussion as a committee about what do we want to uh, provide direction to the staff about as opposed to just reacting to staff uh, requirements of us. 
Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not talking about that. No, 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 I understand. I, no, 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 no. I, 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 this, is a, this is a segue from that. I, your point is that I agree with that. I totally agree with that because the more information we have, the more information we have, the better we can perform our duties. So should we like postulate those those uh, topics to you or will there be a brainstorm well, I think, session? I think, or like I said before, I think if we if you have that concern or you want to bring something forward about getting, you know, getting more knowledge about it, go to Andrew or Andy or whoever and uh, inform them that you're going to give that question or, or present that statement or you know, whatever it is. And they can give you a better answer than they can off the cuff. Oh, sure, no, I get that. I get that entirely on, on board. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. So I'm if sure. you have an issue, then you'd like to get an answer to the committee chair again. Don, I want to talk about this. And then I think Don can say, well, he'll say, I, I'm sure he'll say, yay. Yeah. But, but one of the things that Don does is looks at the agenda and the length of the agenda. And I was saying, you know, we want to make sure that we're cognizant of everybody's time. So, you know, it may not, there may be some things that we can tee up based on the other things, the other action items that are on the agenda. So, well, I think, I, yeah, work through the committee chair. I think part of it has to do with when the agenda is put out on Friday. That's when you might be reading through it. Like that question. Well, bring that forward. Bring anything you have forward sooner because uh, all three of us have to. Uh, come up with an agenda. So, you know, if we have a discussion item that we don't know about, and you, you bring it forward, and after we've got the uh, agenda set, we can't, we can't, we can't adjust that. Uh, so, if it's like prior to Thursday, well, I shouldn't even say that, sometimes it's Wednesday, that I'll get the um, agenda that we're going to bring forward, and then I can, I can put it on this and discussion item or, or whatever at that point. Yeah, and it's, well, I guess I was, what I meant was, in, in addition to asking for an agenda item, when you look at the agenda, Bruce might have a question, and that's the time maybe to go back, for sure. get a hold of that. That's what we always say. Yeah. Yeah. We'd, rather, we'd rather answer questions in advance, so reach out and, you know, all myself, Andrew, everyone's very responsive, so I think that helps you. So maybe you can't raise the question again in the committee if you right. certainly want to educate your fellow committee members, but yeah, you know, it's, it's helpful to all if we know things in advance. That's not only true in committee. It's certainly true across the board. I mean, I see that a lot at the county board, too, where questions are asked that, you know, like, uh, you would have just come forward a little earlier so that that person could be prepared or maybe answer the question, we wouldn't have to spend time on it. Yeah, and I think often that we, that makes that question come up again, and sometimes again, <laughs> you know. Again. <laughs> yeah, so. We don't need three hour meetings. That's right. No, no question. <laughs> and so I, I, part of my question was to what's the agenda for the committee over the course of the next couple of years? So it's, it's a more of a, a, what are we trying to accomplish as a committee uh, for the good of the county, as opposed to just reacting to staff populated I agenda think, items. So, well, so that's part of what I was getting at. Yeah. You know, whether it's a lot of that has to do with our mission statement, though. Correct, Jason. I mean, yeah. Well, our mission I statement. I think what, you know, part of what Bruce is getting at is is that's part and parcel of the strategic planning process that is kind of been derailed. Again, unfortunately, by the, by the pandemic, but that would be a discussion at the committee level of these are the strategic issues that we would like to talk about, you know. Yeah. And I I believe many of them are detailed out in that plan, but there may be other ones that, that could be. And if you have anything else, you know, bring it forward, and you know, we can discuss it. I think that's a live document, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not. Uh, no. It's not restricting in any way, shape, or form. There's no, so probably a, a quick hit on you know nine TMDL and nine key element plans and things would would assist the committee to better understand some of those things, especially you know those of you that are unfamiliar or haven't been 
you know, around through some of those discussions. And I know we did some of that, but in the past. But I know Andy and Andrew obviously have a lot of information on those things. So I don't think they can be part of the agenda or needs to be part of the agenda planning process because you're right. We don't want to get back to the the four-hour yeah. meetings if we if we don't have to. Andrew, you had something. I'll make it very quick. I just want to touch on it in light of this whole discussion. I, I don't want to go beyond, but um, two things. One, I just wanted to know if we if we wanted to come back to the uh, letter from the Hockermans, which is the stormwater issue. I did prepare some stuff. I can just send it to um, to, to Bruce and, and Don if, if that uh, makes sense, or I can send it to the whole committee. Uh, but I do have stuff if you if you want to talk about it today. And then just as in light of other subjects, uh, I didn't get on the agenda today, but I'll, I'll put it in your packet uh, or I'll, I'll email it to you, excuse me, because I'll, I'll need to finalize it before the next NRC meeting. But that is, we just did a park and open space plan survey. We got the results back in the report. I would like to put that draft report in front of you all in case you have any questions or comments on, you know, how that report might be better, uh, you know, display the information, but that that's, uh, largely where we're at. So I'd like to just provide that to you. It's also going to be going through our conference and planning board, but I, I wanted to share that with you. So I'm going to email that to you so you can take a look at it and certainly just let me know of any questions. And then lastly, yes, uh, like like Donna said and, and, and others, um, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm glad to try and work with you on uh, any questions you might have uh, you know, prior to or for the meetings uh, or even agenda items that we can work on with the chair. So The only thing I'll say to that, um, Andrew, is to make sure that if you're sending out this plan ahead of time, that there's no communication between the committee going back and forth about things in the plan. Okay. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Andrew, I'll reach out to you. So you have a call on the way home if you're available. Yes, that would work great, Bruce. Thank you.